in Unit 3, Lecture 4, Part 3, we're going to continue on with our survey of harmful exotoxins that bacteria produce by looking at type 2 toxins, toxins that typically damage host cell membranes. And remember, as you go through these, although I'm not showing them all the time now, don't forget to read your fundamental statements and to be answering your detailed learning objectives to prepare for the exams. So in the last soft chalk lesson, we looked at type 1 toxins or super antigens, toxins that activated excessive numbers of T4 lymphocytes, leading to excessive cytokine production and harm from excessive cytokine production. In this soft chalk lesson, we're looking at the type 2 toxins that can typically damage host cell membranes. Uh, these are often phospholipases or pore forming cytotoxins that can disrupt the integrity of our eukaryotic cell membranes. Now keep in mind when our cells are damaged, they release what are called danger associated molecular patterns or DAMPs, which can lead to excessive cytokine production much the way pathogen associated molecular patterns or PAMPs do when they bind to their pattern recognition receptors. So this can lead to the release of inflammatory cytokines and further damage. And there's quite a few bacteria that do this. Uh, one of the kings of the exotoxin producers is Clostridium perfringens, an endospore producing obligate anaerobe that can cause gas gangrene. Something like 20 different exotoxins have been associated with gas gangrene. But this disease is, uh, has a hallmark of having expanding zones of dead tissue or necrosis surrounding the bacteria. And here's just some of the 20 exotoxins that we know this produces. Alpha toxin, also called lecithinase, increases the permeability of capillaries and muscle cells by breaking down the lecithin in the cytoplasmic membrane. And it's this alpha toxin that's responsible for the gross edema typically associated with gas gangrene. Edema being uh, accumulation of large amounts of fluid in the intracellular spaces of the body. So as the fluid leaks out, as the plasma leaks out of the capillaries and the cytoplasm leaks out of muscle cells, that leads to the edema in the tissue. And if the alpha toxin enters the blood, it can further damage organs. So this is a necrotizing toxin causing tissue death. It's a hemolytic toxin that can lyse red blood cells. It's a cardiotoxin as well. Another exotoxin produced by Clostridium perfringens is capitoxin or collagenase. And this breaks down the support of connective tissue in the body. Uh, the, and the connective tissue, of course, supports, connects, and separates different types of tissues and organs in the body. And as a result of that, the lesions and gas gangrene due to the fluid accumulation and the breakdown of support of connective tissue is often very mushy to the touch. And this, too, is also a necrotizing toxin that causes tissue death. Mutoxin or hyaluronidase breaks down the tissue cement that holds cells together. And that also helps the uh, bacteria and its toxins to spread. Uh, epsilon toxin can increase vascular permeability and cause edema and congestion in organs. Uh, and there's a various other necrotizing toxins that have been found as well. So this has a whole variety of toxins that can wind up damaging cells by altering their cytoplasmic membrane, as well as breaking down tissue cement and connective tissue. Now again, a major characteristic gas gangrene caused by Clostridium perfringens is the ability to very rapidly spread from the initial wound site, leaving behind expanding zones of dead tissue or necrosis. And the organism spreads so rapidly because of the pressure that accumulates in the wound from fluid accumulation due to the increased capillary permeability and the increased permeability of muscle cells from the alpha toxin, as well as pressure from gas production. Being an obligate anaerobe, the Clostridium perfringens gets its energy from fermentation, and as that ferments glucose to get energy, it releases hydrogen and carbon dioxide gases as waste products. So we typically have these deep enclosed wounds 
that are anaerobic. You have the fluid accumulating in the wounds due to the alpha toxin. You have the gas being produced as an end product of fermentation. You have gas pressure and fluid pressure pushing the bacteria into the healthy surrounding tissue. Meanwhile, the capitoxin is breaking down connective tissue. The mutoxin is breaking down tissue cement. And that just softens up the tissue ahead of the, all the pressure that's accumulating from the fluid and gas pushing bacteria into the healthy tissue, causing its necrosis. And often amputation has to be done in these cases if enough tissue damage occurs. Another toxin that damages membranes are called leukotoxins. Uh, these are toxic for leukocytes or white blood cells. Uh, one common example we've mentioned a few times is leukocidin. And this is a pore forming toxin that lyses white blood cells and other cells in immunity. And it can damage your cell membrane. So leukotoxins are produced by several what we call pyogenic bacteria. Pyogenic means pus producing including Staphylococcus aureus that typically causes abscesses, which are by definition pus-filled inflamed lesions of the skin, including accidental and post-operative wound infections, and Streptococcus pyogenes, the group A beta strep that cause strep throat. So those naturally produce toxins that damage membranes, the leukotoxins such as leukocidin. Pseudomonas rigenosa produces a variety of toxins that lead to cell lysis and tissue damage. Uh, examples include exotoxin uh, U that can damage the plasma membrane of cells leading to lysis, phospholipase C that damages phospholipids causing tissue damage, um, alkaline protease that damages tissue, cytotoxin that damages cell membranes and leukocytes, and causes microvascular damage, elastase that destroys elastin, a protein commonly found in lung tissue. And remember, Pseudomonas produces a green to blue water soluble pigment. The pigment's called pyocyanin. And that actually catalyzes the formation of tissue damaging toxic oxygen radicals that can further damage tissue and stimulate inflammation. So, Pseudomonas rigenosa has a whole variety of type 2 toxins it produces that lead to cell damage, typically by damaging membranes of cells. Clostridioides difficile produces toxin A and toxin B. And toxin A damages intestinal mucosal cells, causing hypersecretion of fluids and diarrhea. It also triggers a production of inflammatory cytokines from damaging cells. And it can also attract and destroy neutrophils, causing them to release their lysosomal enzymes, leading to fur further uh, tissue damage. And that can lead to hemorrhagic necrosis, where you have tissue death with bleeding. And then toxin B can damage the cytoskeleton of mucosal cells. So clostridium difficile, as we've mentioned, is responsible for an uh, sometimes severe and even fatal antibiotic-associated colitis where you get inflammation of the colon following antibiotic therapy. And it's transmitted by the fecal oral route and it's the most common gastrointestinal healthcare associated infection, uh, frequently causing healthcare associated diarrhea following antibiotic therapy. So it uh, causes its damage to the colon by means of uh, type two toxins. And that's our highlighted bacterium. Streptococcus pyogenes that causes strep throat can produce a number of enzymes and toxins that damage cells and cause that, uh, inflammation. Streptolysin S is the one that causes lysis of red blood cells and leads to the beta hemolysis we see in lab 14. Uh, Streptolysin O uh, can lyse cells that contain cholesterol in the membrane. It produces proteases that degrade cellular proteins, DNAs that degrade cellular DNA, streptokinase that breaks down fibrin clots, and uh, streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxins. B is actually a protease. Uh, some of the SPEs, remember, were type 1 toxins. So again, uh, the bacterium that causes strep throat has a number of type 2 toxins associated with it. 
uh, the urease and phospholipase that Helicobacter pylori produces, the bacterium responsible for gastric and intestinal ulcers, leads to damage of the uh, phospholipids in the membranes of the intestinal mucosal cells. And one more example, Bordetella tracheal cytotoxin produced by Bordetella pertussis, the bacterium that causes whooping cough. And it's a tracheal, this tracheal cytotoxin damages respiratory cells uh, during whooping cough. And the cell death, the inhibited, inhib inhibition of ciliary movement by the ciliated epithelial cells, and the release of inflammatory cytokines triggers the violent coughing episodes associated with uh, whooping cough. So those are, are some examples of type 2 toxins, toxins that damage cell membranes. And again, remember, make sure you're going through and reading the uh, fundamental statements and answering your detailed learning objectives. I'm not showing these in all the um, soft chalk uh, videos I'm making now. I'm assuming you're doing that. But remember, you're only responsible for the toxins that are listed in your detailed learning objectives. Now, keep in mind that when we're talking about these types of toxins that can damage cells, these are often under control of quorum sensing where the bacterium can sense its own population density. As we pointed out when we talked about quorum sensing in unit two, if relatively few bacteria entered the body and they started producing these toxins immediately, there would be so little toxin produced because there's very, relatively few bacteria present that there wouldn't be any appreciable damage to our body. But that would give our body's immune system a chance to recognize these toxins and make neutralizing antibodies against them. So the bacteria don't want to start making these toxins too soon, or we're going to be able to make these neutralizing antibodies in time to neutralize it before there's enough bacteria making enough toxin to cause uh, considerable harm to the body. So if the bacteria can establish themselves uh, by acting as individual bacteria, and then as their numbers increase geometrically, and as our autoinducers increase geometrically, they can activate the quorum sensing genes where the whole population simultaneously starts releasing all of these enzymes and toxins. And at that point then, uh, the body doesn't have a chance to recognize and make neutralizing antibodies against them in time. So again, often this toxin production is under the control of quorum sensing genes. And there's our uh, self quiz for type two toxins. In the next video course, we'll be looking at type three toxins, those that interfere with cellular function.